The Sydenham River in southwestern Ontario is the only river in Canada to fall completely in the Carolinian life zone and remains relatively undisturbed from industrial development. The river is a biological treasure, home to more than 80 fish species and 34 mussels. It is one of the most species rich watersheds in all of Canada. Several species are found nowhere else in the country. Unfortunately, 25 species of fish, mussels, and turtles are nationally or provincially species at risk. St. Clair conservation biologists monitor many of these species to understand population distribution and trends over time. The Sydenham River has two main branches. The north branch in pink begins as Bear Creek near Arcona and Black Creek near Inwood. These two creeks meet in Wilkesport and become the North Sydenham River. The other main branch is the East Sydenham River in dark blue, which starts in Elderton and meanders 160 kilometers to where it meets the North Branch in Wallsburg. Together, they form the main Sydenham River that runs five kilometers before outletting in the Chenali Cart. The other light blue lines are the creeks and municipal drains that outlet into these main tributaries. Of the fish species in the Sydenham River, six are considered species at risk. Each of these species is experiencing varying degrees of habitat loss. To understand the distribution and population abundances of all the fish in the Sydenham watershed, you may find St. Clair staff in the ditches and streams of back concessions. Seine nets or electrofishing equipment is used to collect every fish at the monitoring site. Fish are sorted, counted, measured, and batch weighed. These data help determine population trends. Is an at-risk species population declining, stable, or increasing? What really makes the Sydenham River special is the diversity of mussel species found here. There are 34 mussel species, but 13 of them are species at risk. Mussels often have interesting names having to do with what they look like. Mussels can live as long as a hundred years and may never travel more than one meter in their entire life. Being long-lived and sedentary makes them quite vulnerable to habitat changes, whether from pollution, changing water levels and temperature, and invasive species like in zebra mussels. Now, mussels may seem rather boring and dull just sitting on the river bottom, but they are anything but. For stationary animals, they have developed some rather impressive means to reproduce and they are phenomenal water filterers. Check out this video to see just how mussels have adapted their life cycle to move their genes far beyond the small area they inhabit. In the streams of Missouri lives the Lampsilis mussel, a simple animal with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness it's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, a perfect replica that will lure bass within striking range.
the mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. If it gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. On impact, the mussel squirts its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills, like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay, drawing blood from the fish, until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed mussels. Also a favorite prey of the bass are these striped shiners, and some mussels mimic them. Considering mussels are blind and have never seen a shiner, the likeness is incredible. The eyes, fins, and even the stripe look just right, yet the mussel knows nothing of its own appearance. These lures have evolved because bass more often attack mussels that look like fish. So fishy looking mussels leave more descendants. After millions of years of blind evolution, this process of selection has turned mussel flesh into a lifelike lure. It takes a good imitation to fool a bass in clear water, and some of them are incredible. This darter mimic even has a mouth which gulps. This mussel is the same species, but its curious leopard print design may not find a taker, and its genes will go no further. This lure looks pretty good, but the bass is unconvinced and turns it down. Mussel lures are constantly improving, but fish are getting ever better at recognizing fakes. It's another arms race, and it's still creating diversity in the streams of Missouri to this day. Isn't that incredible? I said earlier that mussels are also phenomenal water filterers. To feed, Mussels pump water into their shell and across their gills. They collect plankton as well as anything else that's in the water, whether that's microplastics, nutrients, pesticides, and sediment. This filtration process can actually reduce pollution and sedimentation in waterways. In marine environments, mussels can filter 25 liters of water a day. Because they bioaccumulate these extra items, they are called bioindicators, or the canary in the coal mine indicating the health of a watercourse. When an ecosystem is in balance, freshwater mussels can filter sediments from the water column, essentially cleaning the water. When the balance is off, there is too much sedimentation for the mussels to keep up with, and those additional sediments for example, can suffocate the nursery habitat of fish eggs and nests. This slide shows an experiment where a number of mussels were placed in one aquarium beside an empty aquarium. The researchers recorded both tanks for one hour. In each of these photos, you can see that the water in the tank with the mussels in it progressively gets clearer, while the empty tank remains cloudy or turbid. St. Clair conservation biologists monitor mussel species as well. In order to complete proper mussel monitoring, one has to channel their inner mist frizzle and be prepared to get messy and wet. The technique for collecting mussels is called raccooning. On all fours in shallow water, staff dig or paw like a little raccoon through the top six inches of sediment to search for mussels. It usually involves getting soaked. Similar to 
fish monitoring, each species is sorted, counted, and measured. This work requires permits and training to properly identify and handle the animals. Mussels are returned to where they were collected to ensure they are secured in the sediment and situated correctly to minimize stress, sediment suffocation, or risk of drifting downstream. Recently, monitoring revealed a new record of a mussel species in an area that it hadn't been observed in over 50 years. There are six turtle species that live in and around the Sydenham River, and they are all considered species at risk. Turtle nests are heavily predated by skunks and raccoons, with over 90% of nests predated within the first 24 hours of laying. To help improve survivorship, St. Clair biologists scout for nests in the spring and collect eggs soon after they are laid. The eggs are carefully transported and placed in an incubator until the hatchlings are ready to be released at the location they were collected. This process also requires permits and training. If you see a turtle laying a nest and you are concerned about it, please do not attempt to excavate the nest on your own. Even the smallest of egg rotations or bumps can dislodge the embryo and the turtle will not survive. While biologists can monitor, monitor the water chemistry of the Sydenham River by collecting and analyzing water samples, we can also monitor the distribution of benthic macroinvertebrates as an indicator of water quality. These aquatic animals are small, little crayfish, worms, snails, flying insects, anything without a backbone that you can still see with a microscope or a magnifying glass. You can find benthics living on the substrate, in the mud, the leaf litter, or under rocks. Many benthics are the larval stages of flying insects. They are a very important part of the aquatic ecosystem as they process and cycle nutrients in the water and they are a food source for many aquatic species. External pollution can influence the distribution of benthic species as they have varying tolerances to pollution. Pollution can reduce oxygen levels in water, making it difficult for aquatic organisms to survive. Scientists have created a tolerance scale to measure how much pollution benthic species can handle. Some species are very tolerant of pollution, so they are scored a tolerance value of 10, and they can be found in very degraded systems. Others are very intolerant of pollution, so they have been scored a zero and can only be found in very clean water systems. Here is an example of a good water quality site as determined by the presence of certain benthic species. At this sampling site, the creek meanders through a largely agricultural area, but the sampling site is located in a woodlot. There are good vegetative buffers that take up excess nutrients from farm fields before they enter the creek. We've collected mayfly larvae and riffle beetles here, both with mid-range tolerance values. Stonefly larvae do not tolerate pollutants and have a tolerance value of two. Overall, these species indicate that the creek has fairly good water quality. This low flat drain with little to no flow has very little vegetative buffer to provide shade or prevent nutrients from entering from the agricultural fields. Here, we've found scuds and mud snails, both with a tolerance value of eight, so more pollution tolerant. Mud snails actually have a lung sac, which help them breathe underwater, allowing them to survive in low oxygenated water. The non-biting midge or gnat larvae contains hemoglobin, the same molecule that we have to store oxygen in our blood. 
they use hemoglobin to survive in oxygen depleted environments. The presence of these benthics indicate a degraded water quality system. Now you might be curious in checking out the diversity of benthic invertebrates in the ditches and drains and creeks on or near your property. Armed with a dollar store dip net, a bucket, cups and some spoons, you can count, scout for invertebrates yourself. Melissa from our outdoor education department will share how to collect some organisms to investigate. So we talked a little bit about water quality and how we can learn more about the quality of the water by looking at who's living there. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to actually take something called a kick or a sweep net sample. And this involves going down to the bottom of the water, kicking around, and then scooping up all the little bugs that normally would live in that muddy water at the bottom. We can then gather all those bugs up using this special kind of a net, put them into a basin, and then we're able to look more closely to see who's living in this pond and maybe who's missing from this system. Oh, I got a fish. Little, tiny, hopefully you can see it, sunfish. <laughs> Let's put him back in the water. As tiny as these stream invertebrates are, they serve a mighty purpose. For example, the caddisfly larvae construct protective cases for themselves out of pebbles and sand. In a healthy colony, you could find up to 12 million cases in a five kilometer stretch of a river. By creating cases out of bottom materials, that colony would secure 240 million grains of, or eight tons of substrate. They are effectively the glue that holds the stream bottom together. People have actually used caddisflies to make jewelry by giving them small pieces of beads and gold to make necklaces and pendants. Fish, mussels, and other plants and animals become at risk when their population begins to decline at unsustainable rates. Population decline can happen when habitats become degraded or insufficient to provide the necessities of life. Every water body is impacted to some degree by some sort of human influence threat. One threat to aquatic habitats can be the impact of poor agricultural practices. In the rural Sydenham River, poor practices can lead to increased soil erosion of farm fields with excess sediment entering the water, which can smother fish nests. When nutrients are carried off the fields through runoff or tile drainage and into waterways, the nutrient balance in the water can shift, increasing the risk of algal blooms and decreased oxygen. Improperly applied herbicides and pesticides and manure spills can also contaminate adjacent waterways. In addition to adding manure to water courses, allowing livestock access to the water can crush turtle nests laid along the bank and mussels buried in sediment. Poor, agri sorry, poor urban practices can influence water quality. For example, impervious surfaces like paved roads and parking lots prevent water infiltration, which leads to runoff into storm drains. This runoff can carry nutrients and toxic contaminants like oil, dirt, detergents, pesticides, herbs, herbicides, and garbage. Treated and untreated sewage effluent can also reduce water quality. Aquatic habitats benefit from healthy terrestrial habitats. Vegetation acts as a buffer between human land use and the water. Trees provide shade, which maintains cooler temperatures. 
dams can build up sediment upstream and create soil erosion downstream. Dams also limit or prevent the migration of an aquatic species through a system. Finally, exotic species like dracinid mussels, zebra or quag mussels, carp and gobies can be a threat to native species as they compete for food and shelter. The Species at Risk Act is legislation created in 2003 to prevent wildlife from becoming extinct in Canada and is meant to mitigate the threats to populations and habitat. SARA requires Canada provide for the recovery of species at risk that have declined as a result of human activity and manage species of concern so they do not become endangered or threatened. SARA also mandates the creation of recovery strategies or action plans for threatened or endangered aquatic species with stakeholders within two years of a species being listed under the Act. SARA prohibits the killing, harming, harassing, capturing, or taking of species at risk and makes it illegal to destroy critical habitat. Critical habitat is the habitat necessary for the survival or recovery of a listed wildlife species. SARA makes it illegal to destroy any part of a species at risk critical habitat and may impose restrictions on development and construction. So what does that mean? Any in-water work that takes place in an area recognized as critical habitat must be reviewed by local, provincial, or federal authorities and authorized through formal approvals and permits. Projects near water may also require approval from Fisheries and Oceans Canada if activities are prohibited under sections 32, 33, and 58.1 of SARA. If you are planning an in-water or near-water project, you can find more information and applications for permitting at the following website. The critical habitat for all endangered and threatened fish and mussel species in the Sydenham River watershed is shown in red. So this is the East Branch, this is the upper reaches of Bear Creek, and we also see that there's critical habitat all through the Thames River as well. Any in-water or near-water work happening in tributaries marked in red would need to be reviewed and authorized through approvals and permits. Tributaries marked in purple are habitat where endangered or threatened species are or could be found, while the green tributaries are habitats where spe species of special concern are or could be found. You can actually check out an interactive map and click on different portions of the Sydenham River watershed and find out what species at risk are found in specific locations. If a project is taking place in or near water, regardless of whether a species at risk is present, you are responsible for understanding the impacts your project will likely have on fish and fish habitat. You are responsible for taking measures to avoid and mitigate impacts to fish and fish habitat. You also need to request authorization from the minister and abide by the conditions of your authorization when it is not possible to avoid and mitigate project impacts. You are also to ensure compliance with all statutory instruments, including federal and provincial legislation. You can submit your project plans to Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and they will identify the potential risks of the project to the conservation and protection of fish and fish habitat, and work alongside you, work with you to ensure that impacts are managed in the best way possible. If you are looking for more information about in water projects or near water projects and would like to discuss your project with someone, check out this website here.
Thank you for listening to our presentation on the aquatic species at risk in the Sydenham River. If you have any questions about what you heard today, feel free to connect with us at any of the avenues shown.